Good morning and welcome to Ambassador Baptist Church. We're glad to have you here today. And those joining us live from Facebook, we're glad to have you as well. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and have a great day in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me give you something before we get started. Psalms 118 and verse 28 says, Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. And so today, we are here to praise the Lord and exalt him. Amen? Amen. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we do love you today. We're thankful you are our God. We're thankful that we can praise you and exalt you. We pray that you will help us do that today through our singing, through the message, through our fellowship. Father, I pray that you'll be with those who cannot be with us today. Miss Karen, continue to be with her and uh, help her get over the migraines and others that are not able to be with us today. I pray that you'll bless them as well. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way as the message goes forth. And that if there's someone today watching that doesn't know you as their Savior, that through the message, through the singing, through our testimony and lifting you up, you might draw them to you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 <laughs> you know, there's many wonderful messages in the book of Psalms. I've got one here. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Yeah. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Yeah. Amen. So let's start off singing. I can get back here to this page. 375. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. service speaking in both services so be praying for him and then uh, March 26 next month um, we'll be hosting the North Texas Fellowship meeting we'll be having uh, a morning of preaching and singing and no food good old Baptist fellowship without food and, but everyone is invited to come be a part of that we want you to come and uh, listen to some good preaching and I get preached too and 
So I need preaching from time to time as well, besides what my wife does, you know. And so, uh, but it'll be a good time, and everybody's welcome to come, and we'll do all the social distancing and everything like we've been doing. Please continue to pray for Brother CJ and Miss Leanne and their family. Uh, I was talking to Miss Leanne a little bit yesterday, and they're in their quarantine stage, I think, until the middle of this next week, or roughly. And so, you know how it is in that travel trailer with six kids and them, how it, you just can't really, and then Odessa, Odessa, where they're at. It may be longer than that because Keyshawn just got sick. So it may be a little longer than that. But out there where they're at, and in Miss Leanne's words, you go outside the travel trailer and it's dirt and dirt and more dirt. <laughs> so you, anybody that's been to or knows anything about Odessa, you know how that is. So uh, pray for them uh, that God will continue to let them get better. Amen. I remember the first time I stopped there back in, I was driving from here to San Diego when I was in the Navy and needed gas. So there was a water fountain there on the side of the Coke machine. And I took one sip of that and for the next thousand miles to San Diego, I gagged every time I saw, boy, that water out there is just nasty. <laughs> so many, many years of drilling oil has just, just permeated the, the, the water tables out there. No fresh water until it rains. How about the wonderful words of life? 142. Lovely, lovely. 
lovely, he's altogether lovely. The beautiful rose of Sharon, the lily among the thorns. He's the fairest of ten thousand, he's my bride, morning star. He's my friend, he's my savior, he is Jesus, my On Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, he was bruised for you and me. He was buried, and on the third day, he left from that old tomb. He ascended into heaven, and he's coming back soon. Lovely, lovely. He's altogether lovely, the beautiful rose of Sharon, the lily among the thorns. He's the fairest of ten thousand, he's my bright morning star, he's my friend, he's my savior, he is Jesus my Lord. Sharon, the lily among the thorns. He's the fairest of ten thousand. He's my bright morning star. He's my friend. He's my savior. He is Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Amen. He is lovely. Amen. And this is the month of February, which we call the Love Month because of Valentine's Day. And because when I look out and see all you happy couples smiling and in love, and <laughs> turn to John chapter number 15 this morning. John chapter number 15. Our theme, obviously, this year is Lift Up God's Son in 2021. And I was talking to somebody yesterday about our theme and they said, well, how do you come up with things like that? How do you get thoughts for sermons and things like that? What do you do? And I said, well, I, I've got a book full of good messages and verses, and I pray and seek God's direction, and the Holy Spirit gives me things. And, and so I was thinking the message today is God is love. You'd agree with that, amen? amen? And then I was sitting in my office this morning before I came in, and I thought, God is love, and this is February, and we... Consider February the month of love of Valentine. And it's amazing how God just puts all that together. <laughs> and it all falls into place. Amen. But if we're going to lift up God's Son in 2021, we need to love Him. Right. And uh, God is love. We agree with that, do we not? Yeah. And so uh, believers' relationships between each other uh, start out. It needs to be based on God's love. If it's not, you're probably not going to last very long. Uh, but in John chapter 15, verses 11 through 17, that's kind of what the Lord is talking about. He's talking about love between couples and love between one another, not necessarily married couples, but also the church and Christian brothers and sisters. Verse 9 says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my, ye in my love. And so we're going to find out, as we look at this this morning, that this thing about God is love and God's love is a commandment between you and I. We're going to find out God commands that we do that. Look at verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so all throughout the course of this year, thus far that we've been studying, we've been looking at God in the morning and who God is and Christ and, and Jesus and who he is in the evenings. And you see right here, verse 10, If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. And so God the Son loves the Father. God the Father is love, but 
God the Son showed that love by doing what? By abiding in his Father's commandments. And you and I are to do the same. Verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And so if you'll notice in the point number one, the Lord's joy. How many of you knew the Lord had joy? Amen. He says it right there. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you. Now, uh, over in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, very, very important verses. I'm just going to read it to you and give you God's word. not going to elaborate on it because it's God's word. I don't need to. But listen carefully to God's words. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another. Anybody don't understand anything yet? For love is of God. For God is love. Amen? Mm -hmm. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. You can't be saved if you don't love God. Because he that loveth not God knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. It goes back to uh, he is the vine and we are the branches. And without him, we can do nothing. You can't live your life without him. You have to be connected to the vine. So without him, you can do nothing. Verse 10, here in his love. We get love all messed up, by the way, do we not? There's a lot of people out there that say this is love, that is love, that no clue. So let's see what God says. Here it is love. Not that we love God. How many of you loved God before you got saved? I didn't think so. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now here's another commandment. Beloved, if God so loved us, how many of you believe God loves you? Amen. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You know, if the world would just follow these few verses, we wouldn't have all the problems we're having today. But in order for that to get out, and for the world to understand and know that, you and I have to show love. We have to lift up the sun and show that love. Let our light shine, let our love shine, and we'll find out about that in a minute. But point number one, the Lord's joy. Verse number 11, it says that my joy might remain in you. And so, how many of you were joyful when you got saved? Amen. Jesus' joy, as we saw in these verses, was doing what? Was staying in communion with the Father and obeying the Father's commandments. Is that not what verse 10 said? You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so Jesus' joy was doing what the Father commanded him to do. One of those things was to come to this earth and to be born so that he could die and pay the debt for our sins. To become the propitiation, as 1 John says, for our sins. The payment, the substitute. Because that's what God the Father wanted. God the Father said, I love the world so much, I sent my only begotten Son. God the Son said, I love my Father so much, I'm going to follow that commandment and come die for your sins. Are you feeling the love yet? Yeah. And so, Jesus' joy is to do the Father's commandments. But look what it says. Even as I have, uh, for if, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So if you want to abide in Christ's love, you have to keep his commandments. And when we keep his commandments and abide in his love, that's Jesus' joy. A joy that he came and died for us, and so we're obeying him, and that brings him joy. Make sense? I gave it to you right there, amen? Mark 1.35 says, Mark 1.35, And in the morning, rising up, a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Jesus' greatest joy was getting up early in the morning, going to a quiet place, and praying to the Father. What would be one of our greatest joys? 
Get up early in the morning and get a quiet place. Find our prayer closet, our quiet place, and go before the Lord. You think that would bring the Lord and, and the Jesus Christ joy? Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're being obedient to the commandments. God commanded us to go into our closets and to pray. And so when we do that, we're being obedient. When we're obedient, we show Him we love Him, as we'll see in a minute. And when we do that, it brings and increases Christ's joy. Mm -hmm. Who here wouldn't want to increase Christ's joy? And so Christ's joy is loving the Father and being obedient to the Father. When we love Christ, we will be obedient to him, thus bringing him joy. Amazing how all that ties together. Mm -hmm. John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40. Give it a little further, make it a little more plainer. John 6, 38 through 40. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he gave, or all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last days. We're coming close to that point. Amen? Mm -hmm. Verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. That's, do you see that? The will of the Father that sent him, that we would believe on the Son and have everlasting life. Then it says, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so it gives Jesus great joy to come here and to die and, and to do what the Father commanded him so that we might believe, and when we believe, we receive eternal life, and that brings joy to God, and it brings joy to Christ. Because Luke 19.10 says that the Son came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the Father's will. That's why God sent him, to seek and to save that which was lost. You used to be there if you're saved. If you're not saved, you're there now, and he's still seeking and still wanting you to get saved. That's great joy for him. Because he said, all that the Father give me, I'll lose none of them. That sounds like eternal life to me. Mm -hmm. Sounds like when I'm in his hands, nothing can pluck me out. Amen? Amen? And so that's the joy of the Savior. To do the Father's will and to see us come to know Christ. Then there's secondly, the Christian's joy. By the way, if Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, and he said, if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him, what do you think we ought to be doing? We ought to be lifting him up and seeking to bring those to him so that they can get saved. Secondly, the Christian's joy. Look back to verse 11 again. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, does anybody know any verses about joy? Somewhere around, oh, I don't know, say Psalms 51 and verse 12. Where David said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Mm -hmm. And so if verse 11 says uh, that our joy might be full, you know how our joy gets full? When we get all that mess out of our life and we confess our sins and we're forgiven and cleansed. David said, return, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Why did David lose his joy? Sin. What did he do in Psalm 51? He confessed his sins before God. And God forgave him, and he asked God to return unto him the joy of his salvation. And so if you're saved and on your way to heaven, but there's no joy, what do you think is hindering your joy? Sin. All that stuff that you're doing that you're not confessing, that you know you shouldn't be doing, that the Holy Spirit pokes you in the rib and says, you need to confess that. Yeah, I'll do that later, Spirit. David was miserable until he had his prayer of confession. And then, in that prayer, he said, Return unto me the joy, or restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Christians ought to have joy. It says so right there in that verse, 11, that your joy might be full. There's one thing to have joy, there's another thing that it to be full. You know, I can have, I can have this bottle of water up here. It's one thing to have the bottle of water, it's another thing to have it full. And so we ought to have full joy, it says. Is that not what it says? That our joy might be full? Well, how do we get our joy full? Well, by abiding in Him in obedience. We 
got to obey. And so, he says that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And so, a believer's joy is to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I didn't know joy till I knew Jesus. But once I found Jesus, I found joy. My sins were forgiven. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm on my way to heaven. Is there any joy in that for you? Amen. Anybody here this morning? Anybody got any joy? Amen. I know it's hard with your mask to see you smile. But I know you're all smiling behind the mask. Right? <laughs> Is your joy full? Is your relationship between you and God what it ought to be? Or is there some things in there that's hindering your joy? David had Bathsheba and other things in his life. Murder, all those things that took away his joy. What's taking away your joy today? I've seen some Christians, man. They were Their chin was lower than a snake's belly. They had no joy, no happiness. But here's the great thing. You're going to like this play on words. Our joy is just a knee mail away. <laughs> we can just get down on our knee and pray and confess and ask to be forgiven and he'll forgive us and he'll cleanse us and our joy will be full. That's just like when I talked to you about not being filled with the flesh but being filled with the spirit. <laughs> if you're full of the flesh, you can't be full of the spirit. You have to get rid of all that stuff that's taken over the flesh so that you can be filled with the Spirit. Amen? Mm -hmm. yeah, amen? And so when you do that, then your joy will be full. And you can tell Christians when their joy is full. I mean, they're walking around on air, on clouds, floating around, smiling, happy, praising the Lord, singing praises. I mean, you can just tell. And we all ought to be that way, amen? amen. You say, well, preacher, why can't we be that way? Well, number three... Look at Jesus' commandment in verse 12. This is my commandment. Does anybody have any doubt that this is a commandment? I mean, you believe the Bible. Amen. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You love others as Christ loved you? How did he love us? He gave us life. Do we love others like that? You're supposed to. He said it's a commandment. You say, yeah, but you just don't know them. God does. Did he say, this is my commandment, that you love others no matter what? Whether they're good or bad or not? No. We love them, period, like he loved us. And if you have a problem with that, look in the mirror and say, you know what? He loves me just like I am. So I got to love everybody else just like he loves me. There's some days I look in the mirror, I, I wonder why my wife loves me. She wonders some days too. But It's a commandment, is it not? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so Jesus is telling us to love one another. Now, if we love one another, do we gossip about them? Talk bad about them? Say things behind their back? Say thanks to their faces. Would Jesus do that? That goes, what would Jesus do? You think about what he would do, and then you think, am I doing like he would do? Because that's what he says here, does he not? Love them like he loves you. We have problems with that, do we not? Loving one another like he loves us. He didn't say love them sometimes, did he? You see that in anywhere? Did he say love them if you feel like it or not? Love them if they love you first. No. But if they don't love you first, don't love them. Did you say that? Love them when you choose to love them. Maybe on Monday you love them, but on Tuesday you don't love them no more. <laughs> no. No. He said it was a commandment that we love them like he loved us. But then it goes a step further. Not only are we to love them, but we're to love our enemies. Because he died for our enemies as well. Amen. Love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Saved or unsaved, there's one another's out there. Family, co-workers, people, we're to love them like Christ loved us. How are we going to lift him up so that they, they can be drawn to him if we don't love them like he loves them? How are we going to witness to them and try to get them into heaven unless we love them like he loved them? 
Matthew 5, 43 and 44. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Anybody got any enemies? Don't say anything else. <laughs> love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. You didn't do your job. You didn't put your Super Bowl thing out. Shame on you. Sorry, boss. I still love you. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Jesus said, they hated me, they'll hate you. So those that hate us, oh, I don't know, in Washington and other areas, we're still supposed to love them. Yep. Still supposed to pray for them. It's a commandment, is it not? Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. I think we're looking at, at churches and Christians are looking at some persecutions ahead. Yeah. What are we supposed to do? Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Dear Lord, please bless. That's government, co-workers, neighbors, spouses, children, anybody. It doesn't say specific people. It, it says them, the enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them. That's hard to do, isn't it? I got under conviction because I had a little bit of trouble with that in the last few weeks. So now I gotta confess it, then I gotta watch what I say going forward. Pray for our president, pray for our those that are in leadership. Whether we disagree or not, it doesn't say. It says that we're to pray for those that despitefully use us and persecute us and our enemies. Romans 5 6 says. This will kind of put the icing on the cake for you if you're having trouble with those last two verses. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Right. Of which you used to be at one time. Aren't you thankful that somebody loved you when you were ungodly and you were an enemy and showed you to Christ? Amen. And so we're to do the same thing. It's a command. I'm sorry, but it's a command. We were all ungodly one time. Now we're saved, and we're to love like Christ loved us. Somebody loved you like Christ loved them. You got saved. I'm just giving you what the Bible says. Don't be mad at me. Amen? Okay, we'll move on to the fourth point. But it's a command anyway. Amen? The greatest love, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Greatest love ever displayed was when Jesus Christ outstretched his arms and was nailed to Calvary's cross. Amen. Amen. Greater love hath this than a man that laid down, and he laid down his life for you and I. Yeah, that's right. And so if we're going to show great love, we've got to make some sacrifices. Love the dirty four-letter word. It takes work. It takes sacrifice. It requires sacrifice to love some people. My wife's been sacrificing for 36 plus years. It just takes sacrificing. Amen? There are some people that are unlovable. But Christ says to what? To love them. Friends ain't enemies. Amen? I mean, love has a price. Love for you and I cost Christ his life. Love for our enemies and love for, for those that may not be saved and even for those that are, it takes work. It takes a price. There's some sacrifices that will have to be made. Husbands and wives know all too well through marriages, sacrifices that have to be made to, to love one another and to make things work and to and sometimes you have to bite your tongue, and sometimes you have to grit your teeth, and sometimes you have to grit your ribs. Then you just have to say, well, what would Jesus do? And then love them like Christ loved them. How did he love us? Verse 13, he laid down his life for his friends. How many of you are a friend of Jesus? Amen. How many of you are friends of Jesus? Say amen. Amen. Are you sure? Look at verse 14. 
Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. How many of you are his friends? Mm -hmm. You doing everything he commands you? See, I told you it was tough. It takes work. God says that we're his friends if we do everything that he commands us. Now, the Bible says his commands are not grievous. I mean, we can do them, otherwise he wouldn't give them to us. But if we're his friend, we're, we have to do his commands. We have to obey what he says to do. It takes work, does it not? Amen. Amen, preacher. That's good. It does. It takes work. But it's worth it, amen? Sometimes we may have to sacrifice some time. Sometimes we have to sacrifice some money. Sometimes we have to sacrifice whatever it is because love has a price. Aren't you glad that Jesus sacrificed his life? That he loved us so much that he gave himself, died on the cross, went through what he went through, paid your sin debt because you couldn't pay it? Thank you, Adam and Eve. <laughs> and now because of that, we can come to him and confess our sins, invite him into our life to save us. He'll come in and save us, give us eternal life, and then tell us you need to go out and love people like I loved you. And it was a command. This is this I command that you love one another. Lastly, number five, what are the results of the commandment? Turn back to chapter 13. One page back, if you have a Bible like mine, page 1130. Chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Now this is where it gets tough. This is where the sacrifice comes in. This is where you got to decide. Verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. How are we going to lift him up so that he can draw people to him when we can't even love one another like he's commanded us to do. Churches, I know it's not this church, but other churches, fighting, fussing, arguing, going on, you're in my seat, you're in my pew, you did this, you did that. Even some spouses sitting on both sides of the church. How can we be his disciples if we can't love one another like he's commanded us to do it? Think about it. What does your testimony show outside these doors if you don't love him like he loved you? Because if you don't love him, you can't love anybody else. A new commandment I give me, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. If you can't love him like he loved you, you can't Take him out and lift him up out there in the world. If you can't lift him up out in the world, he can't draw people to himself through you. He can do it through other people. But he said, this is how the world is going to know you're my disciple. You're loved one for another. If they can't see Christ's love in us, they're certainly not going to see Christ. Right. Are they? Not at all. And what did he say? Two commandments. That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second is that you love your neighbor as yourself. On this lies all the great commandments, those two commandments. So it has to start with you loving him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That takes work. When you do that, then you have to love your neighbor as yourself. We tried to buy the property on one side of our house. We didn't get the property on the other side. If I could have got that one, I could have loved me and my neighbors weren't there. It would just be me. No, <laughs> but if you remember in the story, it said, who is my neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Your co-workers, your neighbor left and right, your neighbor across the street, your family, friends, everybody is your neighbor. Now, Here's the ultimate tough question. Two questions, actually. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? 
Don't answer out loud. Ask yourself, do I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my mind? He said, if you do, you'll keep his commandments. So then you go back to, if I'm going to say yes to those four, then I have to be keeping his commandments. Then I say, am I keeping his commandments? If you're not keeping his commandments, then you don't love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's Bible. That's not me giving, talking, and whatever. It's what God said. And then, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Well, here's the thing. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. And you can't love yourself without loving God, because God is love. Simple message, but it's full of good stuff. We stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Do you love God this morning? With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Because God said if you don't love him, you can't know him. If you're saved today, do you love him? Do you love your neighbors as yourself? Because he gave you the command to love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Do you love folks like he loves you? Only you really know that. Well, excuse me, you and God. God knows if you do or not. But God has commanded us to love one another like he loved us. And if we're not doing that part, then we can't lift him up so that the, he can draw the world to him. And there's a lot of Christians out there that say they love God, but their lifestyle, the way they live, the way they talk, the way they act, there's no love of Christ that you can see. And so that's what they think about Christ, by the way they live their life. We're to let our light shine. We're to love others like Christ loved us. How did Christ love you? He sacrificed his life for you. He gave his all for you. We ought to be willing to do the same for one another. I know there's days I'm hard to love. I understand that. But God says you still got to love me, amen? That's how they're going to know we're his disciples. I just gave it straight to you out of the Bible. Word for word. If you believe the Bible, then you have to believe that, amen? Our Father, we love you today. We're grateful and thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, that loved us so much that he came and died. We're thankful that you are love. And Father, I pray today that you will help us to be obedient to these commands. First of all, that we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and all our mind. And then that we love our neighbors as ourselves, because you have commanded us to love one another like you love us. And Father, if our love is not there like it should be, I pray that we will confess it and forsake it and get cleansed and begin to love like you love, to love one another and to love the lost and the ungodly with Christ's love so that they can see that we are your disciples. And perhaps through that and lifting you up, you can draw them to you for salvation. And we'll be careful to give you the praise for it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you love that so much, come back at 5. We'll give you some more. Amen. Be careful out there.